Let's turn to uh, Titus 2.13. Our text this morning is, While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we just ask that you would release the, uh, the word this morning. And uh, let there be an open heaven between, uh, between you and these people. The divine revelation would come straight from your throne room, straight to their heart. And Lord, I just pray that you would anoint this word today, O oh God, hide me behind the cross. And Lord, uh, may it not be my words, but may it be spoken straight from your heart, I pray, O oh God. And so, Lord, I ask you to help me to deliver this message, what you want to give to these folks today. And so, Lord, I just ask that you would just bless this word and help me to preach this morning. In your name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. 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 So I have a picture here that I wanted to show you. And uh, first, um, let's see. the. I think I have the next slide, Adam. And... Uh, what is hope during Advent? What is hope during Advent? Now, us being Pentecostals, uh, some of you, how many grew up in a more traditional church, like Catholic or uh, Lutheran? Okay. And so you did all the Advent kind of stuff. And um, we, in Pentecost, we, we just didn't, we didn't do that stuff. I didn't even know what Advent meant, you know, for most of my life. Until I went to graduate school. So, but anyway, I'm going to talk about hope during Advent. I'm going to, I'm going to define Advent for you because it's an important word. But I, this week, I was given, a, somebody sent me a picture, and I want to show you the picture, and then I listened to a podcast, and I want you to consider about listening to the podcast. So show the next slide. So, see this picture on the left? Somebody took that picture, and can you see what that is? What's the goat dressed as? What does the goat have on his back? Has a what? A kid in it? What's that? What does the backpack say? It says gift basket. What comes to mind when you see that? Sadness? Sadness? What else? Sacrifice. Child sacrifice. At worst. Or, um, or child trafficking. The goat has red eyes. Who does the goat represent? No. Satan. <laughs> About the same? <laughs> Is that what you're saying? So, uh, where do you think that was? Where do you think? Who put that up? Where do you think that was at? It is a school. It is a school. Yeah. That's a, there's a lot going on in there. So that's in school. Do you know what state that's in? Oregon. Yep. Oregon. Um, I didn't get permission to divulge that. So, so uh, what what does that make you guys think? <laughs> yeah. There's somebody, there's somebody in that school. I'll just tell you this. I told them I who the person who sent it to me. I said you need to contact the local sheriff because somebody there is is planning on sacrificing or trafficking a child for Christmas. And that's in a public school. My question is, where are the parents? Does, 
brainwashed i mean they see what what did they they pass this off somebody who is a practicing satanist put that up there and they are they are contemplating fantasizing about doing this and uh they they put it up you know what satanists do um when they they uh, many times what they do is they 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 broadcast right in plain sight what they're going to do. And so uh, whoever put that up needs to be put under surveillance. Well, yeah, because they're they're going to do something illegal. They're going to do something terrible. Um, I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. So. So um, this also this week, I've been I've been listening to Tucker Carlson and all of his interviews on X and stuff like that. But you know, I thought it was real interesting. He interviewed Alex Jones, uh, the most hated man in America. I think I think if you get a chance to listen to it, it is long. Greg, it's long. It's like an hour and a half. All right. But it is a good one. And um, he talks, he shows all of Alex Jones' predictions about 9-11 and stuff like that. And um, it, was, uh, it was crazy. It was like uh, a month or two months before 9-11. He, he, he reads all of these uh, like uh, reports and stuff and watches the lines. And, and he predicted 9-11 was going to happen like before it happened. Did you know that? Yeah. I didn't know that. Um, and the reason they did it, I think uh, Dick Cheney was quoted saying, you know what, we need to do something. We need to bring some type of catastrophe or something so that we could ero erode civil rights of people. And then, then he talks about the other thing that I think, you know, he talks about the border, uh, dividing us on, on race. He talks about his own deplatform, him being deplatformed. Um, and then the, the other thing, I don't know, it's kind of weird about Brian Stelter demon video. Um, and then, uh, but the, he talks also about the new world order and, uh, their plans that by 20, I think, what is it? 2030. Um, I, I should have looked this up before I talked about it, but I know one thing is they want that by 2030 and how many years is that away? Seven. Seven. They, they want you to have, they basically want you to own nothing and, uh, and be happy about it <laughs> so they want no gas cars they want no gas cars basically they want to control all the electricity they want to control all the food there will be no more private property rights um, they're going to have you know they're trying to implement a central bank digital currency which is already online which they've already been doing um, um, I got so mad. I got ticked off to this morning. I, uh, you know, Janice had to pray for me all the way here. She rebuked me, but you know, so I'm leaving Kelso and I'm, I'm driving and I go down industrial way. And so, uh, if you've ever been to, uh, kind of Longview and Kelso, I'm, I'm kind of, kind of going over there by the mills and stuff like that. And the port of Longview, they keep unloading these stupid windmills. I hate those things. Um, I don't, I, you know, I think one of these days they're probably going to go here and cut down all the trees to save the environment to set up a windmill, to set up windmills. That's what they're doing over in Europe. They're cutting the trees down so they can put windmills up. And then they're killing all the wells. It's, it's stupid. It made me mad. I honked at the guy because he stopped traffic. And, and I said, I rolled down the window and yelled, get that junk out of here. <laughs> What's that? It is from China. So anyway, um, if you watch that, I'll, I'll give you a heads up. There's, there is some cursing in there, so you might want to mute it when he's opening his whiskey thing up. So I'm not, I'm not saying that he's, uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's a godly thing. But, but I just want, I guess one thing is, is if you listen to something like that, um, most of you kind of know what's going on. And and uh, I guess I better be careful what I say because I'll probably get kicked off of YouTube again here. So, but uh, but I, after looking at at that stuff, but also I was 
I had planned, I was going to preach on um, hope, but I was going to preach on specifically upon the blessed hope. So let's read the full context. What, what, is, uh, what is Christmas hope and our Advent hope? In Titus 2, 11 through 14, for the grace by which, uh, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, to live uh, self controlled, live lives self controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that his very own that are his very own eager to do what is good so the first thing i want to talk about is hope and advent defined i looked up the theological definition of hope Hope is commonly used to mean a wish. It strengthens its, and its strength is in the person's desire. So if we, the way we use hope is, I hope, I hope there's ice cream at the potluck today. <laughs> Yari's not here, so there's no ice cream. So I hope there's ice cream. But that, that is not biblical hope because that is based upon my desire, Right. But in then what biblical hope is, is but hope in the Bible is the confident expectation of what God has promised and its strength is in his what faithfulness. Our hope is based upon God's faithfulness. How many know that God is faithful? And then what is Advent? Advent means the arrival of a notable person, thing or event noun advent the first season of christmas uh of the christian church year leading up to christmas including the four preceding sundays advent the uh, uh, theology the coming or second coming of christ what is advent hope it is the second coming of christ the prerequisite to a godly living in the grace of God. It teaches Christians discipline, uh, discipleship and affords them the blessed hope of the coming of Christ. What is the blessed hope? John 14, 3. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will, prepare, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may uh, be with me where I am. John 14, 3. The blessed hope, the blessed hope for which every Christian should long for is the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our union with Him. It is going to be the rapture. How many are looking forward to that? Amen. This hope is capable of being realized at any time. Thus, Christians should never surrender their prayerful hope that their prayers today, the the, the trumpet will sound and the Lord will return. Amen. I just want to say this. When we come to Christmas, one of the things that we should do, it's not about looking to the baby Jesus at Christmas. What we are looking for is the return of Jesus. Amen. That is what our focus should be at Christmas time. Because if Jesus came once... And he said he's coming back. How many believe that he's coming again? Amen. He is coming again. He is coming again. Matthew 24, 42. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know what day your Lord will come. And then uh, Luke 12, 36 through 40, uh, 40, excuse me. Like men waiting for their master return from a wedding banquet so that uh, when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants who find their master, whose master finds them watching uh, when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve and uh, will he have them recline at the table? And will he wait on them? Uh, it will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time the thief was coming, 
he would have not he would have let his he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready because the son of man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. James 5, 7 through 9 says, Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits uh, for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is uh, for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and, and stand firm because the Lord's coming near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. How should we be waiting for the blessed hope? While we wait for the blessed hope, waiting with expectation and devotion. Waiting with expectation and devotion. Waiting with expectation makes me think of Simeon. Now there was a man, Luke 2, 25 through 28. And uh, you may not be able to read it, my eyes are blurry from the lack of sleep for the last couple of nights. So I'm going to read it off the screen. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to, uh, to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, and then the next uh, slide here, uh, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have uh, seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles for the, and for the glory for, to your people, Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your soul too. A couple of things you may want to notice. Jesus was taken on the eighth day to be uh, circumcised at the temple, which was the, the right a Jewish rite according to the Old Testament. But if you know that they brought a dove for the sacrifice, which means that's the minimum, that's the minimal uh, sacrifice given in, in, on, in that kind of circumstances, meaning that Jesus was from a very poor family. Most people missed Jesus' first coming. Why did old Simeon catch and see the coming of the Messiah? Because he was waiting with expectation. If you want to be part of the blessed hope, you need to wait expecting Jesus to show up. Don Stamps wrote in the Full Life Study Bible, Likewise, in the last days of this present age, in the, uh, when many are abandoning the New Testament apostolic faith and the blessed hope of the coming of Christ, Titus 2.13, there will always be the faithful Simmons. Others may place their hopes in, in this life and in this world, but the faithful will be like the loyal slaves who keeps watch through the long, dark night, waiting for the return of his master. We want to be those types of people that are waiting and looking for Jesus. Amen? Amen. We want to be those types of people. We want to be like Simeon, who's waiting with expectation. Waiting with expectation. There was another person that they met in the temple. And this person was waiting with devotion. Her name was Anna. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel. 
uh, the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until, her, and, until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the rege- redemption of Jerusalem. Luke 2, 36 through 38. When others missed the coming of Jesus, why did Anna get to see Jesus face to face? Because she was devoted. She was like the virgins, the wise virgins, um, the five wise, not the five foolish. She was keeping her wick trimmed. She was living a, a righteous life, and her lamp was full of the uh, full of oil. She was full of the Holy Spirit. This is why we. This is the way that we should live in these days. When you see stuff like what I showed you, I don't want you to be fearful, but I want you to look up with expectation that Jesus is coming soon. Amen. Amen? For the blessed hope, the glorious appearing. Here's point number two. Witnessing with glorious light. This, I was taking this message a whole different way. Last, and then last night, um, this, this verse kind of jumped out to me when I was, when I was thinking about it. I just, I, you know, we had this uh, wonderful uh, you know, prophetic school this last weekend, and and I don't know who somebody asked me. Um, uh, maybe it was Ivana or somebody. I don't know, or maybe it's Kathy. I I don't know. I can't remember. I can barely remember what I ate last night. Okay, <laughs> but um, but the but the thing is, somebody said, "Well, did you enjoy this?" You know, and. And I said, yeah, I, I did enjoy it. Have, have you been through it? I said, honestly, I haven't been through it. I think I heard everything in the six years that I worked with Jeff, Pastor Jeff. I heard everything that he said, you know, one time before. But I never heard it all in a row. And uh, but but the thing is, is I, I got to do something. I got to practice my um, uh, word of knowledge. And uh, I was, it was real interesting because I, don't, I didn't think I would ever... Yeah, yeah, I've had words of knowledge before. But, you know, uh, Pastor Jeff, when you do this thing, he does this thing about where you try to guess the other person's what um, favorite... Not guess, but Jeff has the Holy Spirit. Dessert. Um, the gal I was with, she, she didn't get it, probably because I don't have a favorite dessert. I like them all. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's that was that was a, that's a problem. So, and she kind of got that right. And uh, and they were, I think we were supposed to guess their mother's maiden name or something. Not guess, but ask. And that and that was, it was totally wrong on that one. But the interesting thing was I had Zach's grandmother. I was paired up with her, and so we we prayed and we asked the Holy Spirit. And I was I was praying in tongues silently, and and I heard ear. And I said, is there something with your ears? She goes, yes, I have ringing in my ears all the time. And then she told me the story about when she's four years old, she didn't want to take a nap. And she uh, kind of ran away out of, uh, and climbed in a tree and fell asleep and fell down. And she broke her pelvis. And she didn't even know it until she had her first child. But she damaged her ears when she hit her head. And so we prayed that God would heal her. And then she said, shoulder. I said, well, yeah, a matter of fact, I do have a, I keep messing this shoulder up. And Adam causes me, causes me great pain when he works on it. So <laughs> he stretched it out for me. Um, but, but, you know, I, I made the comment to somebody that asked me. I said, you know, I want to make sure that I get all my weapons loaded and firing. Amen. That's right. I read this verse last night at the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 through 9. I always thank God for you because of his grace given in Christ Jesus. 
For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking, in all your knowledge, because your testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Listen to verse 7 right here. This is the verse I want you to focus on. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be what? Revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. He is faithful. Here's my point. Every Christian in these last days needs to be operating in all of the spiritual gifts. Amen? Amen? And why do I say that? Because I think we need every person using every one of their, any, any gift that the Holy Spirit gives them at any time. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to the prophet with all. I'm, I went back to the old King James. For uh, to one is given the word of wisdom, to another a word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, working of miracles. To another, prophecy. And uh, another, discerning of spirits. To another, uh, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh one, uh, that one and the same self Spirit, dividing to every man severely as he will. You know what that means? It means that every person here, if, if you are a person, say amen and raise your hand. All right. If you are a person, for those that didn't raise your hand, I just want to inform you, you are a person. And the Holy Spirit can use you in spiritual gifts. You need every one of your guns firing. Pursue spiritual gifts, especially prophecy to use inside and outside the church follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts especially the gift of prophecy of 1 corinthians 14 1 um what why is this so important what brings me to my second point winning the lost with proclamation and demonstration winning the lost with proclamation and demonstration 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence of superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing that I was ex while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and pervasive, uh, persuasive words but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. And my thing is, is the only thing that will pierce this skeptical, cynical culture that we are living in right now, where, where, where 30 percent or after COVID or maybe as much as 50 percent completely dropped out of the church, what is going to get what is it going to take to get a hold of them? It is going to take supernatural spiritual gifts being demonstrated before due to them. Yes. We we need people to have spiritual gifts that can that can go and the Holy Spirit tells people that the secret innards of their hearts. Amen. Not their innards, but their inward parts of their heart. I saw, I saw Tammy got kind of queasy when I said innards there. So I didn't mean innards, but I mean, you know, the inner part of your heart. If you can, if, if God can use you to reveal something in somebody's heart, how much more is your word that you're going to give? You must proclaim the gospel with power and validate the gospel with a demonstration of the supernatural. Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels, and then He will reward each person according to what He has done. I 
I just, I just want to encourage you to think about this. I, if, you're, if you're kind of like one of these people that's just saying, well, let me just say this. I admire Pastor Rick Hahnemann. Um, I sent out a little video of him. He, he was the interim pastor here for, what, nine months or so. But uh, what was it? Uh, for how much? 13. 13. Okay, he was, he was interim pastor here for 13 months. But uh, he was, he's, he's done this interim pastor thing for a few years, and he was going to step down. Uh, one night he uh, got up, and I don't know how long ago was that, Greg? Was it been a year? More than a year. He got up in the middle of the night, tripped, fell, hit the wall, and broke his neck. And he is paralyzed from the shoulders down, from the head down. Um, he had some pro he had a little bit of movement, but then they um, did an operation. But you know, his his desire is to serve God, and he he finally got out of that home that he's in, and he came on the church that he goes to at King Circle there in um, Corvallis, and um, he he came in on the wheelchair. And, you know, his little motorized wheelchair, and he gave his test, you know, he, he gave the message that night. And uh, I'm, I, you know, I hear from, from him through, you know, Pastor Steve Berry, you know, gives me little reports and stuff. And every once in a while, I'll call um, Pastor Steve Berry, and then he's there visiting Pastor Rick, and I'll get to talk to Rick. But he's, he's, He's leading people to Jesus in his care facility. In fact, one of the day, one of the times, um, I heard this report last time is one of the nurses came in and she goes, "Man, it's crazy out there. I just like to come into this room because it is peaceful." When Jesus comes back again. He is going to reward us for what we have done. You know, a year ago, Mariana was here. And um, almost a year ago. And I, I don't remember her. She was kind of this missionary prophet gal. And she sent us, she sent, she came to our church. She was sent here. Just for about a month. And uh, we... We prayed for Pastor Rick and uh, uh, Hahnemann, and Mariana said, you know, she felt called. She said, you know what, as I leave here, I'm going to go stop by. And she stopped by, and she saw him, and she prayed for him. And the Lord gave her a word for him, and the word was, God didn't make a mistake when you fell down and you broke your neck. In fact, he held you so you wouldn't die. God has a purpose for Pastor Rick right now. One of these days, we are going to go, and when Jesus comes back again, and he's going to reward us for what we've done here. So I want to encourage you, don't be one of those Christians that say, you know what, I'm, I'm good. I'm saved. I kind of got filled with the Holy Spirit, but you know what, I'm good. I'm good. That's all I need to do. I'm going to make it into heaven a little smoky, but I'm going to make it. No, I, I want to have a, the biggest pile of, of awards that I can have. Amen. If Pastor Rick can do it without getting bitter and angry, confined to a wheelchair, completely paralyzed from the neck down, how much more can we? The blessed hope, our great God and Savior. 
My third point is this, winning with comfort and preparation. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe there's that hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep with him. According to the Lord's own word, uh, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, <coughs> excuse me, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. I was, this phrase caught me when I studied this. Paul said to them, prepare for the rapture, not for martyrdom. When I just showed you that, you know, that terrible picture at the beginning, and then I, you know, I talked about the podcast, and I talk, you know, I talk about all the things that are happening in this world. I'm just going to say this. Paul told the Thessalonians, he told them to prepare for the rapture. He didn't tell them to prepare for martyrdom. Amen? Amen. That's why I'm thinking about, well, well, comfort each other with these words. you got to be crazy. No, yes. <coughs> Jesus said, I'm coming again. We prepare not for our martyrdom. We are preparing for the rapture. Now, brothers, about the time and the dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly, as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Paul inspires the hope in the Thessalonians not by telling them to prepare for martyrdom during the period of the day of the Lord, but in informing them of the rapture. Note that the day of the Lord, the great tribulation, will not start until the rapture takes place. Comfort one another with these words. But you, brothers, are not in darkness so that the day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light, the sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or, nor to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and a hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. How many could say amen? amen. He died for us. So that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, and encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. Knowing the doctrine of the rapture will, will enable you, will enable you to encourage each other. It is not comforting to think that I will go through the great tribulation. It is, it is comforting to know that I will be out of here before the great day of wrath. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. How many could say amen? Amen. amen. Advent, Christmas, is all about preparing for the return of Jesus. If Jesus came once, he's coming again. Let me close with my text again. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing, and, the great, and the, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Remember, we're not looking back. We're looking forward. We're not looking back. We're looking forward. The blessed hope. If Jesus came once, he's coming again. It reminds me of, of Acts 111. The angel, he said, men of Galilee, why do you stand here gawking up into the sky, looking up into the sky? This same Jesus, not a different Jesus, this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back, how? In the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Live accordingly by expecting, witnessing, spurring one another on. Hebrews 10, 23, uh, 10, 23 through 25. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. That blessed hope. For he who promised is what? Faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another all the more as we see the day coming. Amen? Amen. 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 How many could see, receive some encouragement this morning? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Why don't we all stand? Thank you, Leslie. Why don't you uh, reach over and um, grab the hand of the, the person next to you? Unless if, unless if it's another dude, you can just put your hand on their shoulder, all right? So, uh, uh, praise God. Praise God. Father, we just come to you right now in the name of Jesus. And you said that in these days, we should encourage one another. Lord, we're not preparing for the great tribulation. We're not preparing for our martyrdom. But Lord, we're preparing for your coming. We're, we're preparing for the rapture. We're preparing for you to come and take us out of this place. But Lord, I ask you to help us to be busy doing your work. Lord, may we press in to be witnessing. God, may we be filled with the Holy Spirit. Lord, may we... Uh, may we function in all nine gifts of, of the Spirit, O oh God. Lord, in prophecy and words of knowledge and miraculous healings and, and, and uh, a faith, O oh God. Lord, all of these things, tongues and interpretation, O oh God. Speaking in tongues, O oh God. Lord, may all the gifts of the Spirit be resident in us and help us to use it to, to proclaim the Gospel and demonstrate it to this cynical and and skeptical generation, O oh God. Lord, help us to be that, that John the Baptist in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Lord, I ask that you would encourage us this day, O oh God. Lord, that we may not be intimidated by all the things that we see and all the horrible things that we see, but let us be encouraged because we know that you have not appointed us to wrath, O oh God. So we thank you for that, O oh God. You have not appointed us to wrath, but you have appointed us to salvation. So, Lord, I ask that you would help us in these days to be John the Baptist type people going out and proclaiming and demonstrating the kingdom of God with power. Lord, because we know that we'll be rewarded in these last days by you, by your hand. So, Lord, I ask that you would encourage these people and bless them this day. In your name we pray. Amen.